Hello there, old and new friends. Welcome to Divine Musing, episode 11, Story Painted Skin. I am Destiny Rambo Corey, and I am so thankful that you have joined me for this journey into scripture, literature, poetry, and prayer as we view them through the light of transformation and growth. Here's something I've been thinking about lately. We begin with a quote from Gillette Burgess. Our bodies are apt to be our autobiographies. When I was little, I read this book called Gathering Blue by Lois Lowry. She's most known for her work on the book The Giver, and it makes me sad that this book never really got the recognition that I believe it deserved, um, but highly recommend it. Gathering Blue by Lois Lowry. Um, this book is about a little girl named Kira who loses her mother at a very young age and is left orphaned. She struggles physically and has minimal use of one of her legs. In the land that the story is set in, disability is looked down upon, and with her mother gone, she fears that no one will be able to take care of her, and she will be left in the woods to die. She was born with unusually strong hands, and um, this innate gift to be able to weave fabrics and threads. No one had taught her how to do this. It was just part of who she was. The land was governed by the Council of the Guardians, who oversaw three very special members of their society. The singer, the carver, and the threader. Don't worry, I won't give away the entire story, just the basic plot as the basis for today's musing. Long story short, the singer, the carver, and the threader were responsible for keeping the memory of the land alive. The singer would spend years memorizing the song of the land from its beginning to the present time. The carver would chisel a walking stick for the singer to lean on while he sung the, the story of the land, and the threader weaved a magnificent cloak that told the story as well that the singer would wear. Once a year, the people would gather to hear the singer perform the song of their history. Kira was to become the new threader, the one who would repair the robe and embroider the newest pieces of history into the lush fabric. I was about 14 when this book came out, and when I read the segment that I'm about to read, uh, something in me just clicked. See, from the time I have my earliest memories, I would have dreams of color on my skin. I dreamed I had giant blue wings on my back and portraits of those that I loved on my arms. I dreamed of poems and words and scriptures written on my skin uh, as milestones of where I'd been, things I'd learned, and reminders of truth to keep my mind firm in troubled times. I'd never told anyone about these dreams, but after I read this passage, I couldn't keep it to myself. Finally, Kira settled herself with the outspread robe and placed the frame on the newest section waiting to be repaired. As she had often done, she followed with her eyes and fingers the complex story of the world portrayed on the robe. The starting point, long mended now, with the green water, the dark beasts on its shore, and the men bloodied by the hunt. Beyond, villages appeared, with dwellings of all kinds. Curving stitches of smoke from fires were threaded with dull purplish grays. It was fortunate that it needed no repair because Kira had no threads to match. She thought they had been dyed with basil and Annabella had told her how difficult the basil was and how badly it stained your hands. Then complex whirling patches of fire, oranges, reds, yellows, here and there on the robe, these fires appeared, a repetitive pattern of ruin, and within the intricately stitched patterns of the bright, destructive threads of fire, Kira could see figures of humans portrayed, people destroyed, their tiny villages crumbling, and later, even larger, much more splendid towns burned and ravished by fiery destruction. In some places on the robe, there was a feeling of entire worlds ending, Yet always there would emerge nearby new growth, new people. Ruin, rebuilding, ruin again, regrowth. Kira followed the scenes with her hand as larger and greater cities appeared and larger, greater destruction 
took place. The cycle was so regular that its pattern took on a clear form, an up and down movement, wave-like. From the tiny corner where it began, where the first ruin came, it enlarged upon itself. The fires grew as the villages grew. All of them were still tiny, created from the smallest stitches and combinations of stitches, but she could see their pattern of growth and how each time the ruin was worse and the rebuilding more difficult. But the sections of serenity were exquisite. Miniature flowers of countless hues flourished in meadows streaked with golden threaded sunlight. Human figures embraced. The pattern of the peaceful times felt immensely tranquil compared to the tortured chaos of the others. Tracing with her finger the white and pink tinged clouds against the pale skies of gray or green, Kira wished again for blue, the color of calm. After completing this book, I announced to my mother that I planned on having giant blue wings tattooed across the entirety of my back and what they represented for me. How I wanted to see myself like the angels that surrounded the throne of God, covered in eyes and wings. And uh, I told her that I wanted to tell my story on my skin with beautiful ink and colors. I explained how that's how I'd seen myself since I was a child. But when I was old enough to actually go to a tattoo shop, I was gonna begin the process of inking my story. Needless to say, she kinda freaked out, minus the kinda. She begged me to wait until I was 21 to make that kind of decision, even though the legal age to get tattooed is 18, so that I could really be sure, I guess, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I decided to honor her request and wait until I was 21. Um, strangers ask me all the time, how many tattoos do you have? Tell me about them. And then they come up and they touch me and it's weird. Um, all I can respond at that point is that I stopped counting after like 25 and, um, the stories of them are very sacred to me and I don't just tell that to strangers on the street. Um, I've gotten so much flack in the church world from people who believe tattoos are evil. I would never dishonor their beliefs. I just don't share in that opinion. Um, even my grandmother Dottie, when I first told her my intentions about getting tattoos, she told me, um, sweetie, tattoos are for prisoners, sailors, and men in the military. Um, but after I told her my plan of what I was gonna do, she actually got excited to see my newest art when I would come and visit her. Um, certain pieces are obvious what they are, like I have the word virtue on my wrist. Um, I have musical clefts on my wrists. Um, I'm a piano player and so, you know, the musical clefts are what I play with each hand. Um, after our one year anniversary, I had Joel's, um, Joel's signature tattooed just below my wedding ring finger. Um, I have the lyrics, spread hope like fire, down the side of my arm. Um, I have portraits of my mom on my left side and one of my dad playing the piano on the right. Um, but then there are pieces that are a little bit more symbolic and abstract, such as this rose on my hand. That's probably my favorite tattoo that I have. Um, I always associated my grandmother Dottie with roses and every time I look at it, I remember her and it's just a way of carrying her beautiful memory with me. Um, I have the word live tattooed on the back of my neck that I got with my cousin uh, to remember her father, my uncle Jerry, who passed away. Um, he knew how to live life better than anyone I've ever met. And so having that word tattooed on me is a reminder every day to live life to the fullest because you really don't know um, how long you're going to get to do that. I have a long segment of Psalm 18 down my side. Uh, every piece is part of my story. I have a couple things that I've considered removing because of what they meant for me at the time, things I've grown away from or representative of people who are no longer in my life um, or lessons that I've learned them through. Um, as much as I've thought about erasing them or having them removed, I have chosen to keep them because they're part of my story and I don't just want to erase the bad bits or the confusing bits. Um, I keep them as a reminder to never walk those paths again. In a way, those lessons learned tattoos are much like scars. You may be listening today and think 
well, I don't have a single tattoo or even believe that they're okay, but I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know that you have some scars. They are reminders of pain and hurt, but also should be worn as testaments to your survival. I have scars from ways I hurt myself, like this one on my chin right here. Um, it's just under, just under my chin. I, in kindergarten, tried to jump rope with one of the long jump ropes that usually is used for like double dutch. Um, I folded it in half a few times and I tried to jump rope and my foot got caught in the middle and then I fell and yeah. So I have scars from where I hurt myself. Um, I have scars on my body from where other people have hurt me. Um, and I've just come to the awareness that I can't be proud of one and ashamed of the others. Um, this journey has been tough. I've made it this far and divine has never failed me. I've lived too long letting the scars and the tattoos of shame define how I see myself. I spent years beating myself up over things that I can't change. We can't go back and retell our story no matter how bad we want to. We can't erase what's been done to us or really no matter how many times we try to convince ourselves that things didn't happen. Um, when I think about scars and the way our bodies tell the story, I can't help but think about when Jesus appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. Even though he was in his glorified, resurrected body, he was still able to show the nail scars in his hands and feet, the stripes on his back, and the piercings in his side. John 20 verses 19 through 27 says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the so he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be to you. And he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Jesus could have removed those scars in an instant if he wanted to, yet he chose to show them to the disciples to prove he was who he said he was. The scars on Christ's beautiful body are promises we can cling to every time we feel lost or forgotten, unseen or unloved. They are eternal messages emanating from his skin that his suffering was on purpose. He chose to go to the cross for the redemption of all mankind. I know the scars on our bodies are nothing compared to the scars on his. I know my tattoos are nothing compared to Jesus returning triumphantly with King of Kings and Lord of Lords etched into his thighs, like scripture says in Re Revelation 19.16. And on his robe and on his thigh has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm not going to argue theology about whether the inscription was on his clothes or tattooed on his actual thigh, but either way, those words mark him for eternity. The nail scars in his hand and feet, the piercing in his side, the whips on his back mark him for eternity. What are we choosing to mark ourselves with? How are we telling our story on the outside that reflects the truth within? 
How are we learning to accept the truth about who we are and who we have been without trying to rewrite history in a way that seems safe and appropriate? I am learning every day not to live in fear of my story, but to celebrate how far I've come. The beautiful thing that I go back to with the book Gathering Blue is that we all tell our stories in different ways. Singers, carvers, and weavers alike, and so many others. We are all testaments to the faithfulness of God and our own resilience to persevere. I tell my story through tattoos and songwritings and these musings, but you will tell your story in a way that's uniquely your own. If you are in a place of learning to accept your scars or figuring out how to express your story, if you need the help of divine to show you how to let go of fear and to embrace the gritty truth of who you are, why don't we pray this prayer together? Divine creator, you sent your son Jesus to earth to show us the way, the way to heal, the way to grow, the way to be a living testimony. Meet me in my frailties and teach me to forgive myself for the scars I have inflicted upon myself and the courage to forgive those who have scarred me. Reveal to me the vastness of how far I have already come and give me the strength to continue on the road ahead. Let my story not allow fear to rise within me, but a boldness to declare the goodness you have surrounded me with. Let my scars remind me of survival and let them be a testimony to those struggling and in pain around me. Let me dance in my colors, unashamed before you and the world, knowing that every part of me is seen, known, and loved by you. Help me to be a walking example of how love conquers hate and how light will always overcome darkness. Give me boldness where there once was fear and forgiveness where there once was shame. I vow from this day forward to stop rewriting history in a way that makes me comfortable, but to own my truth in its entirety. I know that you meet me in that truth and will guide my steps towards ultimate healing and restoration. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I will leave you with a quote from Steve Goodyear. My scars remind me that I did indeed survive my deepest wounds. That in itself is an accomplishment, and they bring to mind something else too. They remind me that the damage life has inflicted on me has in many places left me stronger and more resilient. What hurt me in the past has actually made me better equipped to face the present. I hope this musing has given you a little something to think about too.